Episode 1 of House of the Dragon begins, with House Targaryen at the height of its power. Ten adult dragons lay under their banner in the year is 101 AC. King Jaehaerys called a great council to choose an heir. Over 1,000 lords make the journey, with 14 different succession claims heard. But only two are truly considered. Princess Rhaenys and Prince Viserys Targaryen. Declared by all the lords, Prince Viserys is made the future king. A woman will not inherit the Iron Throne for now. The irony here is that the council was called to stop a war breaking out, but yet the irony here is that the family themselves are on the brink of declaring war itself. Fast forward nine years and King Viserys I is on the throne. If you didn't subscribe to my YouTube channel, Please give it a hit and press the bell icon to get updated with my channel. Liking and sharing the video motivates and helps me to grow. Now, let's continue our video. We're 172 years before the death of the Mad King, Ares, and the birth of Daenerys, who obviously goes mental and slaughters everyone at the sound of bells. But I digress. Dragon and Targaryen live in harmony, with the city thriving and the house at the height of its power. Princess Rhaenyra is the focal point here, and after flying in on the dragon and meeting her friend Elysa Hightower, she has desires to fight in big battles and head out on the battlefield, but her mother is quick to quell those doubts. For now, she's stuck with filling goblets for the council. In the wake of the Targaryen arrogance, believing themselves to be untouchable, there are problems. The growing alliance in the Free Cities has convened on Bloodstone, led by the Prince Admiral known colloquially as Crab Feeder. Lord Corley's Velaryon's concerns are met with an indifferent shrug. King Viserys is expecting the birth of his child soon, and he's convinced that it's to be a boy. Rhaenyra listens quietly, eyeing up the various men of influence around this table. For now, Rhaenyra visits Prince Demon Targaryen. She finds him sitting on the Iron Throne, but this is much, much accurate to how the books describe the chair, surrounded by hundreds of swords, sticking out like thin gravestones. Demon hands over a necklace for the young princess, Valyrian Steel. Demon is in charge of the armies, and he's quick to rile up his gold cloaks, deciding to conquer kings, landing, and make them fear the color gold. And part of that comes from some pretty gnarly punishments. Demon himself delivers several killing blows, going after criminals and hauling away dismembered remains. The king has been under heavy stresses lately and unfortunately, that means his health has taken a bit of a battering. The Grand Meister checks out a nasty wound on the man's back, coming to the conclusion that it needs to be cauterized. As for Viserys, he's absolutely adamant he's having a son, telling his wife about his vivid dreams of their son wearing a crown and ruling. After losing five babies, the queen is quick to point out that this is the last time. I've mourned all the dead children than I can. She says at last. An ominous bit of foreshadowing, perhaps. News of demons' nighttime slaughter soon reaches the king. Viserys is not happy, and that the council demons questioned over the gold cloaks being used heavy-handedly. Demon is convinced he's doing the right thing, chalking this up to promoting law and order by making the people fear the watch. Funnily enough, Corlys agrees with him. Otto Hightower does not. Viserys speaks his piece all the same, telling him to use the gold cloaks, but not to step outside his jurisdiction. At King's Landing, Viserys holds a big tournament. The jousting is an impressive display, although George R. R. Martin would likely have spent seven pages here describing all the banners and potential food on offer. The drama really picks up though when Demon arrives on horseback. It's a shame that Game of Thrones ended the way it did because that final speech from Viserys could have been so much more impactful had the final two seasons stuck the landing. Alas, this prequel set 200 years before those events actually gets off to a pretty good start. 
The costuming and world building are both great, and the characters are intriguing and certainly have an element of unpredictability about them. The show has managed to maintain a level of visceral violence and nudity too, which feels impactful and well-placed in the story and in Martin's world. The history of the Targaryens has always been a fascinating period of Westeros, and it's great to see that explored here. All the pieces are certainly aligned to make for a really interesting season that could well make for a great companion piece to Game of Thrones. While it certainly won't make up for that disastrous ending to the fantasy series, this is certainly closer to the first season of God than anything else. Whether it can reach the illustrious heights of seasons 3 and 4, however, is another matter. It's way too early to be casting judgment on this one, but so far, House of the Dragon has all the right elements to be a success, armed with decent characters, a thin sliver of action, and an ominous sign of things to come in the future. House of the Dragon certainly looks like a strong fantasy series, and one thing's already clear, this is going to completely put Amazon's rings of power to the sword when that drops in several weeks' time.